This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about the artists, writers, composers, musicians, filmmakers and other figures that have influenced them and inspire them today and the cultural experiences that have defined their lives and work. And in this episode, it's a brush with Candice Brights, a filmmaker whose work, mostly in the form of video installations, explores selfhood and identity, community, race and gender, and how the cult of personality and mass media like television and cinema shape our response to them. Brights was born in Johannesburg, South Africa in 1972 and began studying art at the University of the Witwatersrand there during apartheid in the early 1990s. She was acutely aware of the privilege that she as a white person enjoyed in being able to study art, something then denied to black people in South Africa. Candice, who now lives in Berlin, came to many people's attention with Mother and Father made in 2005, which featured Hollywood actors performing parental roles. There are six women, including Meryl Streep, Susan Sarandon and Julia Roberts, and six men, including Dustin Hoffman, Harvey Keitel and Donald Sutherland. They're cut out from the original film, entirely shorn of their original context and set against a black background, and shown with the five other actors in a tense collage conversation. Mother and Father revealed reveals how normative parenthood is as represented in mainstream movies and suggests that society is conditioned by that conservatism. Candice has often explored the persuasive power of fiction and celebrity as mediated through pop cultural forms. She made a series of video installations about fandom, where up to 30 fans are filmed individually, singing along to entire albums of their idols' music, among them Queen, a portrait of Madonna, Legend, a portrait of Bob Marley, and I'm Your Man, a portrait of Leonard Cohen. In each piece, the fans sing along with music on headphones, so we only hear their voice. Together, they add up to an a cappella chorus of devotion, but each enthusiast is also an individual, their passions, flaws and idiosyncrasies animated by the music and captured by Candace's camera. In recent years, her work has become increasingly activist in approach and her analysis of celebrity culture more bitingly critical. In Love Story, made when she was invited to make work for the South African Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2017, she filmed interviews with six refugees forced to flee their countries for Europe due to a range of oppressive conditions, from Sarah Mardini, who escaped war in Syria, to Shabina Saveri, a transgender activist from India. She then asked the actors Julianne Moore and Alec Baldwin to perform the transcripts of those interviews against a green screen. She showed the film with Moore and Baldwin in one space and the six original interviews in another, contrasting the experience of refugees who are so often nameless and faceless in the media with the actors who, Candice says, are the very embodiment of visibility. Love Story is a comment on the media and public obsession with fame and the concurrent lack of empathy for refugees and asylum seekers in contemporary Europe and beyond. In the video installation TLDR, meanwhile, as we'll hear, she drew attention to how celebrities influenced the discussion on sex work, flying in the face of a report by the human rights charity Amnesty International. I met Candice at Goodman Gallery in London, where she was about to present a distinctive installation within her body of work. Digest consists of a thousand and one videotapes encased in polypropylene video sleeves. Each one features a single verb from the title of the film embossed in white acrylic paint on the case in the font from the sleeve of the original VHS and surrounded by thick impasto black paint in a variety of patterns and effect. Some will be instantly recognisable to some of us, but each word, like those film sequences I mentioned earlier, is severed from its original context, so even if the words are originally nouns or adverbs, they become verbs in Candace's installation, like shop from Little Shop of Horrors or back from Back to the Future. Many of the cassettes are then gathered in thematic groups according to the verbs, relating to sex or sensuality, for instance, or financial transactions. It's crucial to Candice that the content of the videos remains unrevealed revealed, we'll never know what lies inside. And it's with this work that I began our conversation. Candice describes it as her first analogue piece, but how does it relate to that rich body of work in digital media that preceded it?
Digest came about really due to a set of circumstances. I unexpectedly found myself um, having some surgery in 2018 and realized that I was going to be living through a period of, of reduced mobility. And it became very clear in the early weeks of my recovery that there's no way that I could sort of continue to operate within my practice as, as I had for, for the last good two decades. Typically, my process involves a lot of very uh, physically taxing shooting and production and and editing in particular which often involves very very long days in the studio uh, sort of grinding one's body into into a desk chair and it became clear that none of this would be possible for a good long while at the same time the possibility of not being able to work for an extended period of time was was something that I couldn't accept and so I set out to to think about a form of video production which would be uh, free of, of some of the physical challenges that that are typical of video production and ultimately I would describe digest certainly as as within my of at least um, an unusual example of, of analog making. But at the same time, I'm quite insistent that this is a video installation. And I like to describe it as a thousand and one channel video installation. In a sense, the work grew out of an interest in the overlap of two things in time. On the one hand, a moment when we slowly started to shift into a digital relationship with the moving image, which I think coincides with, of course, with the demise of analog videotape as we sort of shift in the early 2000s to, to formats which, which carry information digitally and then eventually, of course, the object drops away entirely and we're left with pure data, pure streaming data. And I was interested in how parallel to the demise of the body of the moving image, because I think that with video, uh, the moving image still had a body, um, in, you know, which carried it. There was something very physical about the videotape in the sense that you needed to leave the house to go to the video shop and you would sort of wander around the video shop and find that tape. And there's a particular smell that those tapes had and a particular sound that they made when you shook the box and they would melt. Um, if you left them in the sun and make all kinds of whirring and clacking sounds when you push them into the machine. So I think that video as a medium, videotape, very much was still of the physical world. So at the same time as the moving image is slowly migrating from its physical body into a more virtual space, we ourselves were starting to withdraw from the public sphere and spend less and less time amongst other bodies within collective experience. And I think most obviously, um, you know, that occurs when it comes to moving image with a kind of slow shift away from going to the movies, uh, going to the cinema to collectively uh, take in a film to cough and sneeze and laugh and, and gasp uh, together as we absorb a story. Um, and then, of course, slowly video, uh, yeah. videotape marks the moment when we're taking these movies home and watching them in smaller collective spaces, often within the space of family. And then gradually over time, I think more and more, um, we're experiencing our moving images on small personal digital devices, whether it be a phone, whether it be a tablet or, or a laptop. And I think that there's a loss. There's a loss that occurs within that migration and within that shift. And I would describe that loss as, as to some extent being a loss of the body in the world, a withdrawal into internal spaces, um, mental spaces, virtual spaces. And I suppose that one way that you could describe Digest is, is as a kind of memorial to or monument for the loss of that 
analog collective experience. This really was the starting point for the project. I mean, to what extent are the 1001 objects that we will confront in this piece, because it's a sort of a kind of grid surrounding the viewer of these black boxes, which have these single words, verbs on them. To what extent was the process of choosing those items a kind of random archival search? And how precise was it? You know, I'm I'm intrigued by the kind of selective procedure there, because it it must have been quite some endeavour, even if you even if you say, as you say, it's not so physically taxing, it must have been quite mentally taxing. Well, this was really a kind of, it happened in phases, right? So at the beginning, uh, when we set out to find the verbs, uh, it was really started with scouring encyclopedic books, which sort of sought to list and, and archive the names of movies or, or uh, volumes of, of film criticism and just scouring film names, looking for verbs embedded in the names of films. And so, as you can imagine, verbs like love and hate and kill and shoot uh, were very prolific. And at an early point in the project, it was quite challenging to decide which which love we would use, for example, which of the film titles we would uh, appropriate uh, for a particular verb. As we got deeper and deeper into the project, it became, of course, increasingly difficult to find verbs which resonated on all the levels I wanted them to resonate. So, of course, on the one hand, I wanted to have a thousand and one verbs without any repetition, although I will confess that there's one repetition in the work. The verb to double appears twice um, nice. <laughs> in the work. Uh, so truthfully, there are a thousand unique verbs in the work. And as we sort of moved deeper and deeper in, it got harder and harder to um, isolate verbs that we hadn't already incorporated in the work. So at a certain point, we were sort of getting desperate and coming up with verbs like quarantine. Interestingly enough, prior to the uh, beginning of the pandemic, we had uh, added quarantine to the list, to ghostwrite, to immortalize, to eternalize. One of the things I'm really interested in in your work is this balance between the language of art and the language of popular culture, in the sense that digest is clearly indexical, so you can link it very clearly to certain traditions within conceptual art. But at the same time, also, again, it's a popular medium Mm. that you're, in in a way, immortalizing or memorializing. So... To a certain extent, would you say there's a consistent uh, engagement with the language of art meeting the language of popular culture and the kind of playoff between those two things in your work? Accessibility is really important to me. I think about it a lot. Um, And that's not because I don't value uh, work which is more hermetic or harder to access. But I've over the years come to think that that part of my reason for being deeply invested in what I would refer to as shared culture, because of course what makes popular culture popular is the fact that it's absorbed by a huge number of people. And I think that having had a quite a bizarre art education in Johannesburg, um, ironically, It became very clear to me very early on as a young artist that I didn't necessarily want to travel down that path. I was interested in whether it might be possible to work in complex ways and explore complex thoughts in such a way that one would be able to enter the work without having to have specialized knowledge. And over the years, I've come to think that this has a little bit to do with my South African experience. So growing up under apartheid, due to how effective um, that apartheid was as a system, it really meant that only a very tiny percentage of people had access to uh, higher education, to university education, and certainly a great number of people didn't have access to to even a, a decent basic education. I think that, that that would be true for so many black South Africans. The resources weren't there, the infrastructure wasn't there, and the government had very little interest in making education available to South Africans at large. And I think I started 
to find that depressing, the notion that were I to sort of make work that was legible to a certain class of people who were educated and privileged, it would mean not being accessible to a huge number of other people. And I guess that in my thinking about how one addresses an audience, I've always been intrigued by forms which can offer both a kind of tangled and complex series of layers, but which can also just be entered very, very simply through an, an emotional experience or through humor or, or, or through um, something which is familiar, something which is known. So I would say that my, my tendency to sort of reflect on the popular very much uh, comes back to an interest in, in being able to, to be in conversation um, with a broad range of people, not only those who live in the art bubble as I do. <laughs> and in a way, you've been able to adopt that mode of address of using a language uh, which is not in the art bubble, but also to analyse how that works in the broader culture in the sense of love story is a very powerful, if you like, indictment of the fact that the stories of refugees can be conveyed by celebrities and therefore reach more people. But at the same time, the media can only process certain ideas when they are through a certain kind of mouthpiece, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think that there is somehow an interesting thing that, that links Love Story to Digest, and maybe we can come back to that. And it has to do with the way that stories can save you or, or, or not. Um, I think that narrative can be a very powerful tool of survival. We tell each other stories to figure out who we are, to figure out who other people are, to capture and hold our history, to imagine better futures when we're going through difficult times. And Love Story, I, I think, is a reflection on the extent to which the packaging of a story influences or affects our ability to listen to that story and to feel that story. And unfortunately, I think as we have become creatures of media more and more, I think our lives are uh, shaped by what we consume. And that could be anything from cricket and rugby to, to theater or, or music or literature or art. And I'm interested in, in how... Over time, we've come to accept a reduced set of packages for the carrying of stories. And I think it has to do with the role that the marketing of stories plays, particularly in the mainstream. With Love Story in particular, I was interested in telling the same set of stories twice. Uh, on the one hand, when you first walk into the piece, you can spend time with a uh, montage, which uh, is roughly the length of a feature film featuring uh, Alec Baldwin and Julianne Moore. And it very quickly becomes apparent that the words that they're speaking don't belong to them, that they're not sharing their own embodied experience. So um, it becomes clear that they're, they're telling stories of displacement, about being forced to leave their homes. They're mentioning having spent time in places like Lubumbashi and, and, and Syria and uh, Caracas. And Yet, although these stories are not theirs, their ability to deliver a sort of slick, um, uninterrupted, appealing uh, version of these stories makes it quite hard, I think, for many viewers, not all, to move on uh, to the second room of the piece in which you encounter the six people who have lived the stories that are articulated by Alec and Julianne in the first room. And in the second room, you can sit down in front of uh, six monitors on which the actual people who have lived these stories, each of whom has been basically forced to leave their homes and, and start new lives, uh, you can sit down and hear them tell their stories in, in much greater detail and at you know, much greater length. And of course, these are not professional storytellers. So their English is accented, and there's repetition, and there's meandering, and uh, non sequitur, which I think makes their narrative style far more interesting and far more engaging 
to me. But ultimately, um, you, as a person who's spending time in the piece, is encouraged or asked to circle between these two uh, different tellings of the same set of stories and figure out what your relationship is to each of these modes of storytelling. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests now. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? I think I remade every painting that Van Gogh painted between the ages of 12 and 15, probably. (laughs) Maybe a little younger than that. I guess it would have to be Van Gogh. Do you look at Van Gogh now? Do you have him around you? Is Is he still present in your thoughts? Not at all. (laughs) I was looking at the impasto. I've got, I've got, I'm lucky enough to have one of the videotapes right next to me where I'm sitting here with you now. And I was looking at the impasto. I was thinking that there's a lovely sort of enjoyment of paint there. And that doesn't owe anything to those early recreations of Van Gogh that you did. Well, the lusciousness and the kind of bodliness of these tapes really, um, I have to give credit to this amazing team of, of young painters who, who worked on Digest. And, uh, you know, I must confess that these tapes, although they're kind of really rich in painterly gesture and you feel the human hand moving across them and the kind of globs and splotches and and which for me really are traces of the body. I want them to be a celebration of embodiment. Uh, as I said, in some in some ways, what Digest does is to mourn the loss of the body, um, and so the body reappears through these these brushes um, moving across the tapes. However, my role in putting all of this together was really very similar to the role I play when I work on a set. Um, And so I would describe myself as having directed Digest. Um, I was not on the painting team. I was sort of buzzing around from painter to painter, discussing, uh, making decisions, thinking about what would work, what wouldn't work. A lot of the time, um, a piece would start with somebody just responding to the verb. We we didn't want to have the paintings be illustrative or, 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 or very literal. So if I felt that a member of the team was taking it you know in the direction of illustration then we would discuss and we would move it in a different direction which historical artist do you turn to the most now i think much more about literature and film and um, theater in the making process i have a very troubled relationship to the canon because like so many other people when it comes to historical artists I've grown up uh, with a canon which I find very alienating. During my Van Gogh period as a child, (laughs) (laughs) I was given uh, by my parents um, a subscription to a magazine, which must have probably been British, I would imagine now in retrospect, it was called Great Artists. And every week you could pick up the latest issue it was magazine uh, a week that came out and one week it would be Van Gogh and the next week it would be Manet and then it would be Michelangelo and then it would be, you know, the whole canon. And this actually went on, I would say, for a good five years. And then you would collect these magazines up in encyclopedic volumes, uh, which which in the eyes of a child looked very grand on the shelf, but they were actually pretty tacky, kind of plastic, cheap gold uh, text on on sort of, plasticky blue covers anyway it would it, it made a huge impression on me and I would sort of as a very geeky child would sort of religiously wait for for the new issue of great artists but of course as I kind of grew into a more complex understanding of of how the world is structured it became very frustrating to me that all of these great artists happened to be uh, not only men, but white men in particular. And if I remember correctly, it was a long time ago, but I think Frida Kahlo may have been the only uh, woman who appeared amongst these great artists. And so I am really not so interested in rehearsing the canon and going back to the canon. Nonetheless, 
it seems to me that e- even within Digest, there are, and you've, you've said that, for instance, a, a work by Richard Serra, who's an artist who's still with us, of course, but also a work which is his verb list, um, and then also some, something like Onkawara's date paintings were works that contributed to your thinking around the piece. Yeah, Digest does definitely doff its hat to a lot of the ancestors. It's not dissimilar to Manzoni's artist shit, for example, in the sense that the contents are inaccessible. Uh, in the case of Manzoni's work, we know what's inside the tin or, or what, what he claims is inside the tin, but it's a gesture of withholding. Um, something is, is refused. It's a, it's a narrative refusal. Similarly, um, as I was making the piece, I thought a lot about uh, Brotes, Marcel Brotes' uh, Pense Bet, where he buries his own poetry in a sort of lump of concrete and and makes it impossible to access the innards of the books. I was certainly thinking about Richard Serra's verb list just in terms of in a kind of accumulative archival attempt at, at thinking about the verb. I mean, the verb, of course, is is always about modes of embodiment and about being in a body. I was also, uh, you know, a little bit haunted during the making of the work by Ankawara, as you've pointed out. Ankawara's practice is very much defined by this incredibly arduous repetition of the same, uh, which is always shifting and, and producing small differences, but which roughly speaking is confined within a certain set of parameters. I think of this work a little bit as a kind of self-portrait in as much as so many of the films which are in the piece are films which have cut up and included in past works of mine or referenced or films which have been important in evolving other pieces of work. And it does to some extent feel like a little tribute to my medium. I started making art, the earliest works which I haven't destroyed were in analog video. And um, much of my kind of growing as an artist in, in the early years was done through the medium of videotape. I'm exhibited work on video until DVD became a thing. And so it, to some extent, this is my archive. This is, I guess, for me, comparable in my thinking about the work to Marcel Duchamp's Boite en Valise, where he sort of puts all of these works into a sort of smaller setting. Um, or I was also thinking about um, Warhol's very late uh, paintings, the retrospective series, where he starts to draw on, on works from the past and sort of montage them and collage them on top of each other and almost becomes... He's archiving his own practice. He's looking back. There's something, well, as the title says, retrospective about that mode of working. Which contemporary artists do you most admire? You know, when you have so many friends who are artists and when you're constantly looking at art and thinking about art, this is a question that you are not in a rush to answer. (laughs) Um, I guess that if you ask me that question today, I would say that I am sort of very closely following the work of artists like Grada Quilomba. Ming Wong is a favorite of mine. Yael Batana, always love seeing Yael's work. Uh, Jumana Mana is is someone whose work I've gotten to know well recently and, and I'm really loving. Ottobong Nkanga, who is is just so powerfully everywhere at the moment and, and who just seems to be able to endlessly offer the most magnificent experiences to one. Um, while we're in Nigeria, I would say that Emeka Ogbo is also a favorite of mine, uh, working uh, predominantly with sound in, in, in really magnificent ways. Uh, young artist whose name is Sophia Zusmilch, uh, who I was very excited to discover a couple of years ago. But to be honest, when it comes to the contemporary, I often find it my inspiration gets ignited more by film and theater and literature than it does by contemporary art. And that may have something to do with the fact that one tends to be, I think, as someone who sort of lives and eats and breathes and and sleeps art, one tends to be in a very 
analytical mode when looking at, at art exhibitions, which maybe is a bit of a, a pleasure blocker. Whereas I think when I'm sitting in a theater or, or when I'm at the movies, I'm, I'm much more open <laughs> and, and much more loose in my reception of things. So theater has been very important to me in the last year. The, the work of playwright Sibylla Berg, most recently an amazing play at the Gorky Theater in Berlin. Is Sagt mir Nix is the title of the play. Uh, the Gorky Theatre at the moment is also hosting an, an amazing uh, Polish um, artist whose name is Marta Gornetska. And Marta orchestrates these very elaborate uh, Greek choruses where collectives come together and, and uh, speak collectively in a way which is incredibly politically um, provocative, but at the same time really able to, to, to sort of draw emotion, very, very powerful. And then films, films, films. I mean, um, what have I seen recently that I've loved? Obviously, we've all been locked up, so I've been catching up on a lot of films, which I just wasn't able to see at the time that they came out. Some recent favorites have been um, The Assistant by Kitty Green, which is a very painful analysis, I think, of, of the Me Too moment, one which sort of takes you inside the life of a woman who is subject to the power of her superiors, the men around her. Um, recently, I've loved Border, Ali Abassi was the director, I think. I love um, Yorgos Lantimos' work, the Greek director, in particular, uh, Kino Dontas' uh, Dog Tooth, which is really a story about how language can be totally reinvented. Charlie Kaufman's very dark study of masculinity, uh, I'm thinking of ending things. Um, get Out, which I saw very late because I just wasn't able to get to the movies at the time that it came out, but which I think is just an absolute treasure, as is Us or, or US. A German documentary, which I saw recently, which is called uh, Seven Brothers uh, by the director Sebastian Winkels, which literally so he, Winkel sits down with seven brothers who were born to the same period, I think uh, roughly between uh, 1920 and, and, and 1940 in Germany. And they grow up having very different relationships with their parents and particularly with their father uh, based on how they were positioned um, in the context of the Second World War. And it's, it's a fascinating study just of how differently individuals can be shaped within the same intimate domestic familial space what do you have pinned to the studio wall so i mean there, there are lots of references that you've already discussed but do you have images and objects around you in the studio so there is a nice uh, juicy photograph of a fresh placenta hanging on my studio wall and that landed there um, because one of the other projects that I've been working on for the last few years, um, which is called Labour, uh, has involved uh, filming a woman giving birth. And it's a sort of slow, long burning project. But at this point, I've, I've uh, had the honor of being present to seven births. And, and so that that's where the placenta comes from. Um, there are three magnificent portraits by Zanele Mohan. Holy, um, which I really value. I feel like they keep an eye on me and, and keep me honest. A beautiful, uh, naive oil painting by my boyfriend's grandmother. Um, <laughs> a lovely text piece by a young Indian artist. His name is Berenda Yadav, who I bumped into when I was last in Mumbai. And a great piece which hangs above the door. And two very, very precious drawings by William Pope L., uh, one of which reads, white people are good to eat, and the other of which reads, white people are death in sunshine. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. The app offers access to around 50 cultural institutions through a single download, with new partners being added every month. Follow Bloomberg Connects on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and stay tuned as new digital guides are announced. The social channels also offer a sneak peek of some of the app's exclusive content. 
Among the recent additions are the Louis Armstrong House Museum, the revamped Courtauld Gallery and the Studio Museum in Harlem, which is currently showing Witness by Thomas J. Price, a former guest on this podcast. If you download the Studio Museum's guide, you can hear Thomas talking about the comparable energies of his native Brixton in London and Harlem. To explore interactive guides to all the partnering institutions, download Bloomberg Connects today. You can find the app at bloombergconnects.org. It's also available to download from the App Store and Google Play. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? Well, um, you know, I'm going to give you the pandemic answer to that question because, of course, we've all, in some ways, I think it's been very nice. We've all been forced to spend much more time in our own cities and and it's been harder to gallivant. Um, And so in Berlin, my favorite art space and the one that I probably return to most frequently is, is a space called Savvy Contemporary, which has really changed uh, the landscape of Berlin in terms of who you get to hear and what you get to see. The space was founded by an incredible man whose name is uh, Bonaventure uh, in De Kung, but it really is a a collective labor of love and, um, you know, has a a vast team of people, some who have been there since inception and some of whom sort of come and go, artists, writers, poets, um, filmmakers, and savvy always um, has something worth seeing or hearing. They do a huge amount of programming. It's astonishing how much they put into the world for a relatively small institution which is modestly funded. But um, up until the arrival of Savvy, I want to say a decade ago, I'm not sure exactly when they landed in Berlin, but I do use the word landed because up until Savvy arrived, it really felt like the artscape was, was incredibly European and incredibly white and incredibly male. And one institution can't shift things completely but Savvy's been really important to me just in terms of having another place to go to where it's not the usual suspects every damn time. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? This is a difficult one to answer because I think that cultural experiences are never divorced from the sort of political and social circumstances that they're embedded in and undeniably it's it's a negative answer but undeniably the cultural experience which has has most profoundly shaped me is the experience of growing up under apartheid right from the start as you say one of the instincts you had for making art was about being privileged enough to have an art education and wanting to use a language which, which was accessible to a broader group of people and it seems to me that you've been conscious of your privilege as a white person growing up in a system as you say of apartheid and that has driven a lot of your decisions from an artistic point of view since. I think that those of us who care and those of us who think that things need to change and carry on changing understand that the power of whiteness really uh, to some extent rests in its ability to deny its existence in its tendency to pretend that it's invisible in its assumed innocence and so typically when we speak about race um, it almost always means that we're speaking about the experience of people of color Um, and I think that the project which is not my project is a project that many people are working on is really to try and visibilize whiteness, to, to, to really make it opaque, to really take us to a point where we understand that um, the operations of power that are typical of whiteness can't continue to be granted invisibility and need to be outed. So maybe that's what I try to do in the work, not always, not always in the same way, But I'm very interested in the outing of whiteness and and in the exposure of whiteness. And in fact, when you were invited to show at the South African Pavilion in Venice, a work that you made around that was called Profile. And it features a number of other South African artists who say, my name is Candice Brights. And then there are all sorts of narrative confessional elements one's never sure of what actually is happening but it's a process of confronting the very fact of you a white South African being invited to show at the Venice Biennale and represent your country well I think any artist would be very excited to be invited to show 
in uh, the National Pavilion of their country at the Venice Biennial. And I certainly was. But at the same time, it felt very fraught, the invitation, for a variety of reasons, some of which really have nothing at all to do with me or South Africa. I mean, I, I think it's clear that, that the way that the Venice Biennial is structured very much kind of reflects and mirrors uh, geopolitical relationships. So, you know, the most powerful economies have the biggest pavilions and the best budgets, and there's a sort of kind of nauseating way in which a visit to the Venice Biennial can tell you everything you need to know uh, about how the world works. And, and that applies uh, even to the countries who are absent from the Venice Biennial and who, who are not able to be represented there for one reason or another. But in my personal case, I think it's obvious that um, there's something very strange and difficult and problematic about imagining that I, as a white South African, could represent this country. And that kind of troubled me in my kind of thinking towards the biennial. On the one hand, I hoped that there would be some reflection on that within the piece that I actually showed in Venice, Love Story, um, in the sense that the way that, that that piece is structured, your attention is drawn to the fact that, that whiteness has a very extreme visibility in the media and stories told by sort of a conventionally attractive media, philic white actors tend to receive such prominence and, and such support within the media. And of course, within Love Story, those are played off against um, not only uh, bodies of color, but, but the stories of people who live in bodies of color. Uh, but as you say, Profile was made during the same stretch of time, and it just seemed so obvious to me at the time that I was invited to Venice that there were so many other artists who might have just as easily been invited and whose who's, who's work was, was certainly of a caliber. And so I thought it would be interesting to invite a range of other South African artists uh, of, of various descriptions, various uh, lived experiences to, to help me tackle this kind of conundrum, right? What does South Africa look like if you're trying in the realm of contemporary art to represent the contemporary South African experience? Can you really do that through the work of one white woman and one black man? Because in fact, uh, in, during Venice, um, we split the pavilion and uh, alongside my work, uh, there was work by the artist Mohal Modisa Keng. And so, yeah, in profile, I basically invited 10 South African artists to step into my shoes to play me and to um, answer a set of questions which nobody likes to answer. Uh, you know, what is your race? What is your language? What is your religion? What is your gender preference? Or I won't say that nobody likes to answer them, but certainly they take us into very difficult space because so many of these questions are difficult uh, and, and lead you down a binary road that you might not necessarily want to be led down. But so the artists sort of speak about who they are, sometimes truthfully. I mean, these are artists. So, of course, they, many of them saw the opportunity to be playful and, and to mess with the concept and to fictionalize their answers. But ultimately, what you end up with is, is a portrait of a South African artist told through a cross-section of 10 artists who I think are each you know, very idiosyncratic and, and collectively, I think when you hear these 10 voices trying and failing to describe um, what a South African artist is, it becomes very clear that, that we've got a long way to go when, when it comes to thinking about, about what it means to be of a nation. Which writers or poets do you return to the most? I, in terms of literature, um, lately the last thing I read was a novel by uh, the South African author Deborah Levy, who I think is based in London, um, Hot Milk, incredible story of a mother and daughter. In terms of returning, returning, Toni Morrison is someone I go back to again and again. Have you heard her audiobooks? <laughs> I haven't. I haven't gone into audiobooks, should I? Glenn Ligon on this podcast recommended listening to Toni Morrison reading her own books and I started to as a result and it's it's utterly extraordinary so I highly recommend it because it's her as Glenn says you know inhabiting her characters and it's extraordinary that so. sounds lovely <laughs> I'll look into that actually 
people I return to all the time, Octavia Butler, Louise Erdrich, Audre Lorde, Doris Lessing. I read fiction when I can. I must admit, fiction always feels like a guilty pleasure. It always feels like something you do when you're taking time off. And I wish that wasn't the case. But more often than not, I'm reading nonfiction in preparation for a work or, or towards the research for a work. Um, sometimes it's sort of heavy and theoretical, but sometimes it's just voices who I kind of think of as oracles, people who help one to find one's way through the moment that one is living through. So voices like Roxane Gay, Hannah Gadsby, not a writer, but a comedian, but I think very much a writer nevertheless, just these extraordinary screeds on on what it means uh, to, to... Great to art of, historian too, no? Oh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. She started off as an art historian, right? Yeah, yeah. It, the German writer Margarete Stokowski, uh, someone who I come back to again and again. Kutzir, I have a love-hate relationship with J.M. Kutzir. I think he's important because his work is so symptomatic of what it has meant to live through South Africa through a certain period of time. And in a way, I would say that Jonathan Franzen is someone whose work I don't like, but I grapple with it. Um, I think of Franzen and Kutsia in the same breath because there's a certain way in which they look at the world through male eyes, which I, I find very hard to identify with. But nevertheless, the ways in which they build characters and describe characters has been very interesting to me. I want to return a bit to Octavia Butler. She's a name that artists repeatedly say to me in the same way that Emily Dickinson is, for instance. And I'm always interested in why artists working in such a broad range of media might all refer to a particular author. What is it about Octavia Butler that you like? Of course, she's a she's a science fiction writer, but she writes very pertinently within the rubric of science fiction about race and about identity. So tell me what it is that appeals to you about her work. I mean, I think you, you're pretty much nailing it. I think her ability to use a future language to describe the present and the sort of exquisite balance in her writing between observation of lived realities which aren't going away anytime soon, um, oppressions and hardnesses that that are very real and very now, but then the way in which she reflects on them through constructions of possible utopian futures, which sometimes slip into dystopia, and of course the very, very powerful feminist uh, messaging that resonates throughout her work. I mean, I've been returning to her work most recently quite specifically in relation to the piece which documents births, and I've been reading a lot of speculist uh, feminist science fiction, so some of the more obvious names like Margaret Atwood, but what's been more generative for me is science fiction written by feminist authors who have sought to address the limitations of their own experience at a particular moment in time through imagining how things could be different at a future moment. And so that would apply also to a writer like Louise Erdrich. I think that for many women and many people of color, narrative has been a means of survival, a means of, of imagining a time when things may be different and a means of making sense of the present and offering haven not only to themselves through the process of writing but to those who read their writing. Talking about storytelling, we can't not talk about Scheherazade and the Thousand and One Nights or the Arabian Nights. Um, it's a massive part of Digest and I think you've said it's in fact the biggest influence on Digest. So I was invited to make a work for the Sharjah Biennial in 2019. And in my kind of thinking and pottering in the studio, trying to figure out how I wanted to, to take on this, this invitation, I came across the story of a young woman called Princess Latifa. And Latifa is the daughter of the vice president and prime minister of the United Arab Emirates, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. And she, in early 2018, 
had tried to escape Dubai. Um, she wanted to seek political asylum abroad and I think really was running away from a very comfortable, very luxurious life for reasons which must have been very, very compelling. She ended up being captured on a yacht that was headed for India, um, tranquilized and, and taken back into solitary confinement under the guardianship of her father and family. Uh, she later filmed herself under conditions of uh, solitary confinement and, and spoke about her desire to escape. And interestingly enough, Latifa's sister had also tried to escape. And I became very interested in this desire to escape from the Gilded Cage, which I read as a kind of rebellion against the patriarchy against the power, the, the sort of power that was represented by her father. And um, it got me thinking back in time to a story which I think is, is not too unsimilar, um, the story of Shazerade from the Thousand and One Nights. Uh, and I think a lot of people know the story. Uh, Shazerade literally weaponizes narrative to avoid losing her head. Uh, so Shariah, her husband-to-be, had been married a good thousand times, according to the Arabian Nights, before he asked Cesare to be his wife. And Cesare knew very well when she married Shariah that her days were numbered. And she came up with an amazing strategy to sustain her life, which was each night when Shariah would come to her, her chambers, she would spin an elaborate story she was a phenomenal storyteller, according to, to all accounts. And uh, she would tell an elaborate, long, compelling story and always ensure that she would sort of arrive at a cliffhanger uh, close to daybreak, which made Shariah hungry for more and which meant that she was allowed to live another night and another night and another night. And ultimately, after a thousand and one nights of storytelling, Shariya asks uh, Shazerade to, to be his queen and she no longer faces the risk of, of having herself decapitated, as was the case for the thousand wives before. Although I started to conceive and, and work on Digest um, a good year before COVID-19 descended, I was still very much in the midst of making the piece when the pandemic struck. And uh, I think many of us all around the world, those of us who are privileged actually, faced lockdown conditions. We, we were forced to withdraw from the world and our bodily capacity was severely reduced. And I think a lot of us during that period of time fell back on, on narrative as a means of, of keeping ourselves sane. So for some people, uh, during the weeks or the months of lockdown, depending on where you were, some people turned to reading and literature and others turned to Netflix, of course, which is another form of narrative. But I think that within that kind of limited space that was available to us um, during the sort of more difficult periods of the pandemic, I started to, to think that, again, there was some kind of analogy to the experience of a Princess Latifa or a Chazerade. Uh, in other words, people left alone with the story, people no longer having free and easy access to the world, people no longer able to be mobile and, and within a social context and, and having to fall back on an inwardness, which often then I, I think means that one goes to books or movies or stories um, as a means of keeping oneself sane. <laughs> Which music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? Very eclectic, um, a lot of oldies, um, some more recent stuff. It really depends on my mood. I mostly don't listen to music when I work because mostly I'm editing and, and a lot of my work is very strongly structured by sound, so it's the sound of the work. But if I'm able to listen to music, then it could be anything from Joan Armstrong, to Grace Jones. Recently have been re-listening to a lot of the old Kraftwerk albums, revisiting them. 
Uh, when it comes to running, uh, Frank Ocean is, is a favorite. His album Blonde, I love to run to. Uh, if I need to be sort of picked up and reanimated, then I do love a little bit of vintage salt and pepper. Sly and the Family Stone I've been rediscovering lately. Fantastic. And a more contemporary note, uh, love Billie Eilish. Um, big, big fan of Lizzo, Tierra Whack more on the kind of like old school white feminist front never get bored with uh, bikini kill but then i think it's good to always sort of subdue that with a little bit of solange or brenda fussy missy elliott some guilty pleasures lurking in the background i, I can't not love neil diamond's voice <laughs> um i do listen to more leonard cohen than is probably healthy for any single human being Love peaches, 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 can't get enough of peaches. And packing music, always sati, always sati, I always pack to sati. How oh, nice, is that to keep you calm as you pack? There's a sort of, sort of serenity in the, in the process of packing. Well diagnosed. Very good. Um, you mentioned salt and pepper there, salt and pepper were one of the pieces of music that appears fragmentedly within TLDR which is what? extremely <laughs> there's a number of pieces of music so that piece begins with Mariah Lynn's very powerful once upon a time I was a hoe and it's a piece which is about sex workers and specifically about a particular engagement between a group of celebrities and sex workers can you explain more about that piece so TLDR was made in conversation with an incredible and, and really fierce collective of sex workers and sex work activists who are based in Cape Town in South Africa. And I, I would like to just mention the name of this collective, which is SWET. Um, it stands for the Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task Force. In 2014, um, one of our most celebrated South African artists, whose name is Zuleta Mtetwa, brutally murdered a very young woman um, whose name was Nokopila Kumalo. I was heading to Cape Town in December 2016 when I became aware um, via feminist friends um, within the art community in Cape Town that the South African National Gallery was staging an exhibition which they called quaintly our Lady, and the curatorial claims made by this exhibition, which was curated shockingly by three white women, uh, m making the claim that this would be an exhibition which would reconsider gender and the representation of gender within the context of the South African National Gallery, uh, which of course is our most representative institution. And uh, at the time that this exhibition was being put together, Zuletu was already a couple of years into uh, his trial for the murder of Nokopila. And to our dismay, the South African National Gallery had decided, or at least these three curators who were putting this exhibition together, had decided that it would be appropriate to include Zuletu's work in the exhibition, a portrait of a young woman, in fact, a photograph of a young woman. There were many of us who felt that it was extraordinarily inappropriate to platform at the level of national representation Zuletu during this trial for the murder of Nakupila. What brought me together with the Sweat community was an evening at the South African National Gallery on which uh, both the Sweat community in great numbers um, and a relatively small number of South African artists of feminist inclination showed up at the South African National Gallery to protest this exhibition and to demand that Zuleta's work be removed from the exhibition. It was out of that encounter with Sweat and slowly starting to speak to various members of that community, get to know them, that TLDR grew, really out of a, a desire to, to see whether we could bring together their skills and my skills to try and tell the story of sex workers, not only in the South African situation, but sex workers globally, uh, who typically in, in most nations in the world, obviously their labor is, is uh, criminalized and they live 
very abject, precarious lives. And um, at a certain point, we started to plot and plan. And I'm talking about a community here, which is an incredibly experienced community of activists, all sex workers, but uh, people who are trained um, and skilled activists as well. They don't get very much platform because it's not a very palatable topic. And most people get very squeamish and, and kind of Victorian around sex work, conversations about sex work. And so we decided that we needed to take a stab at, at changing some of that or at least sort of thinking about some of that prejudice and stigma and telling a story about sex work which, which might make it possible for people to see sex workers as workers, to understand the ins and outs of the lives of sex workers and, and to reconsider sort of moralistic opinions about sex work. So that really is how we ended up making a musical about sex work <laughs> in which 10 of the activists from the sweat community come together as a Greek chorus and really sort of tell uh, th their story but at the same time it's embedded in in a in a real life story of white saviordom so at a certain point a huge coalition of people led by an organization called the coalition against the trafficking of women uh, sought to derail an amnesty international in initiative which wanted to decriminalize sex work uh, globally. And so Amnesty was working very hard to ensure better conditions for sex workers via the decriminalization of sex workers. But the Coalition Against Trafficking of Women were working in the opposite direction and wanted to see all forms of, of sex work uh, forbidden and nixed, basically. So at some point in their endeavor to block the Amnesty Initiative, the Coalition Against Trafficking of Women um, launched a petition demanding that Amnesty step back from this initiative. And they very cleverly managed to sneak this petition I imagine, this is speculative, but in my mind, what they managed to do was to slip this petition into the inbox of one or two very, very prominent uh, celebrity actresses. So within a short period of time, this letter against the Amnesty Initiative had been signed by the likes of Emma Thompson and Meryl Streep and Charlize Theron and uh, Kate Winslet and a huge number of very, very prominent uh, celebrity figures. And of course, that meant that the letter, the petition went viral, it was all over the internet. And uh, when celebrities take on a cause in this kind of white savior mode, um, it's very easy for that cause to garner a huge amount of public support. In the end, the Amnesty Initiative went through and they, they continued with their work. But nevertheless, it was a moment where it was very clear that the, the, the power and the force of of white feminism, if you want to call it that, um, as practiced by the likes of, of these Hollywood actresses from their positions of power, came very close to derailing a very important and very serious initiative to improve the lives of women who exist at the very opposite spectrum in terms of privilege and who are living very precarious lives. And so the work, on the one hand, it carries this, the, the real experience and the real stories of the community that I worked with. And there's a, there are a series of 10 interviews with those people so that you get to hear them speaking about how they found their way into sex work, what they find empowering about their labor, dark stories, humorous stories. But at the same time, we wanted to tell this bigger story, which really I think is, is a reckoning with white feminism and white saviordom and, and all those good intentions which white people have without necessarily understanding how their translation of those intentions to action might be doing more harm than good to the people that they're trying to save in inverted commas. And it ends with a sort of very direct form of activism as in the chorus that you talked about sings for the last what 20 minutes or so of the film it's like we're watching a a, a protest effectively and it's, it seems to me that's tremendously powerful and obviously very deliberate actually not um, actually it was beautifully unplanned that scene so 
after the kind of story has been told uh, within TLDR, there was a moment on on set where it's a very structured piece. And if you've seen it, uh, the, the 10 activists are lined up in a very kind of strict grid. And that was that was my format. But when we were done with the shoot, um, I said cut, and there was such an incredible energy um, on the set, and spontaneously uh, everyone who had been participating in the shoot broke out of that kind of very uh, stiff structure of the piece and just started to sing and celebrate the moment. Um, this is something that we hadn't planned in advance. And when that happened, I looked at uh, the two people I had working on camera and asked them to, to carry on rolling, uh, not knowing that I would use it for the piece at all, but it just, just felt like a, like a very special moment because we worked very, very hard and everyone was very, very tired. And yet there was an absolute need in the room for some some singing and dancing to happen. What made it very poignant was that the songs that were sung uh, for the next half an hour were really protest songs, songs of protest, old South African protest songs, which, which came into being during the struggle against apartheid, but which very much remain present within South African protest culture and which tend to be retooled for different purposes. Also, what I really, really liked was it just felt like they broke down my structure and built their own structure, this community, at that moment when I said cut and the, the piece kind of decomposed through their agency and they took over. And, and, I, and I thought that that was something was, which I didn't plan and couldn't have planned, but it just felt like I was moved out of the way. I was uh, displaced as director in that moment. And what came of that was is so moving and so beautiful and so relevant for the piece. So that was really a gift from the sweat community. <laughs> If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? You know, I really don't know how to answer that question, but I, I wouldn't say no to an Ankawara painting with my date of birth on it. If, you know, if there's one out there that somebody wants to, to send my way, I'd be happy to hang it in my home. That's a great choice. And lastly, what's art for? Art is for helping us to think. Art is a lens, it's a filter. Uh, I don't think that art invents anything or says things that we don't know, but I think it allows us to access our experiences um, of the world in new ways. And I think that means that when one finds art compelling, one finds oneself leaving, having one's thoughts challenged, uh, having felt something, ideally for me personally, I I really like it when the things that one thinks makes one feel and the things that one feels make makes one think. So I'm very interested in that kind of uh, ping pong between feeling and thinking in making the work. And I think that what art can do is to just offer us new ways of, of, of thinking about experiences which we know and, and challenging our expectations and our assumptions. And I think that the challenging of one's knowns and one's assumptions can be helpful in terms of thinking forward to a better world. Candice, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Candice Bright's Digest is at Goodman Gallery, London, from the 25th of November until the 20th of January 2022.
Candice also has numerous works on view in museums around the world. TLDR is in Witch Hunt at the Institute of Contemporary Art Los Angeles until the 9th of January next year. Her work Mother is on view at the Kunsthalle Mannheim in Germany until the 6th of February 2022. Her work I'm Your Man, a portrait of Leonard Cohen, is at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco until the 13th of February. And Becoming Julia is showing in Gazes Out of Time at the Kunstmuseum in St. Gallen until the 24th of April. Alien, Ten Songs from Beyond, is at the Nouveau Musée National de Monaco until May 2022. And coming up, she has solo shows at the Museum Folkfang in Essen in Germany from the 10th of March and the Fondazione Moderna Arti Visive in Modena, Italy in June 2022. You can watch many of Candice's video works on her Vimeo channel. That's vimeo.com slash Candice Brights. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the art newspaper podcasts are Judy Mahalska and Amy Dawson. Thanks to Henrietta Bentel, Daniela Hathaway and Kabir Jack. A big thank you to Candice Brights. See you next week. Bye for now. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.